be able to meet face to face uh, such a divine personality while still present on this earth. Uh, I am glad that my godfather is here. We were so fortunate, God brothers and God sisters, that we had the mm, causeless mercy in our lives to be able to have the uh, direct connection and association and initiation by uh, the most transcendental Mahabhava personality, our beloved Srila Prabhupada Esi Bhakti Adhanta Swami Maharaj. So, it is inconceivable that we have such a blessing in our life that we were able to be present while he was performing his pastimes of spreading this Krishna consciousness movement throughout the, the earth planet, the most wonderful historical epic, which will be glorified for centuries and centuries into the future uh, to come by all the Vaishnavas, how this divine personality inundated the earth planet, how by being so much um, empowered, especially by Sri Nityananda Prabhu, that he gave Harinam to all the Jeeva souls, the fallen souls. But you know, when we were with our Srila Prabhupada, he was the only pure Vaishnava that we knew of. Hmm? I mean, we were there in the Western countries drowning in the modes of passion and ignorance, and suddenly this divine saint came into our lives and changed the course, the direction of our existence. So, we knew nothing but his lotus feet. And we knew nothing but his books that he gave to us. And we knew nothing but his order that we should follow and help him, uh, assist him to uh, serve his Guru Maharaj, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, by preaching this message of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So I was fortunate for seven years, from 1970 till 1977, to be uh, in the association of Srila Prabhupada and serving him also, as most of us did most of the time, in separation and carrying out his order, his instructions. So, but it's, uh, it's an interesting fact to me that the very first day that I ever entered a Hare Krishna temple in America, 1970 August, uh, and I came there to become a devotee. Uh, and I vividly remember that there was a magazine sitting there called Back to Godhead magazine. And uh, when I opened up the magazine, the first uh, article in that magazine, it was titled, Descent of the Holy Name. And the personality who was the author of this article was Srila Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar So, I didn't know anything about him. At that time, I even didn't know anything about Srila Prabhupada. I was just new to being introduced. Uh, but I was very intrigued by the language of that article. And uh, years later, when I reread that article again over the years, every single time that I would read it, I would become so astonished. Uh, so, in some amazing way, uh, my introduction to Krishna consciousness way back then uh, was that Srila Sridhar Maharaj had some little role to play in that. Anyway, as the years went by, uh, I just want to try to explain how it is that this personality came into my, my life because it's very important for me whenever I speak about Srila Sridhar Maharaj to try to uh, reflect upon his contribution to my spiritual life. So, during the 70s, 
during that time period, there were a number of occasions when I heard from uh, Srila Prabhupada about Srila Srila Maharaj. This came up now and then. Like, for example, I heard that Prabhupada said he has one godbrother named Sridhar Maharaj who is a pure devotee of Krishna. So, that was a pretty authoritative statement because none of us ever thought that there's any other pure devotee except for Prabhupada. So, when he said that there's another pure devotee, I became quite intrigued to, to know who is this person. And then I remember that in 1975, uh, when uh, we were involved in a very great marathon to, to uh, produce the books of Srila Prabhupada, it was a two-month marathon in which he gave an instruction that we should publish and print 17 volumes of his literature. I won't go into the story, but anyway, um, it was a mammoth task and, and uh, at the end of that task that we accomplished, then Srila Prabhupada wrote a letter um, that blessed all the devotees. And then one of the uh, leading um, BBT trustees at that time, he asked Prabhupada, he said, well now your, your Srimad Bhagavatam translation is going very quickly. Uh, so perhaps you will soon finish that. So when you finish that, is there any other uh, literature that you'll begin to translate? And he was suggesting another like epic, because Srimad Bhagavatam is a great epic work. So he suggested that Prabhupada would translate Mahabharata or something like that. And then Prabhupada said, no, uh, that, that literature is not as important to us in terms of bhakti as the literature of the Goswami and our previous acharyas. So those literatures should all be translated. And then the next question he asked him was, if for some reason you're not able to complete the Srimad Bhagavatam translation before you leave this planet, is there any other personality that can do this? And then I remember, because I read it with my own eyes, it was posted on the outside of the temple, this letter. Yeah. And, and, and he said, Prabhupada answered, he said, there are only two persons on the planet who can write purports to the Srimad Bhagavatam in the English language. That is myself and my godbrother, Bhaktivedanta Sri Maharaj. So when I saw that, naturally a thought was implanted in me that Wow. That's a pretty high recommendation. I hope that I get to meet this person someday. Uh, so, and still I didn't really know anything about him. Then, in uh, 1977, when Srila Prabhupada was performing his final pastimes here in Vrindavan, and he was uh, showing signs that he would, his imminent disappearance would soon come. At that time, the managing persons of, of his movement approached him and they asked him, Oh, Srila Prabhupada, you may be going from this world, so is there anyone else after you leave that we can go to for guidance? And then, at that time, Srila Prabhupada said, Yes, you may approach my godbrother, Bhaktivedanta Sri Maharaj. So, when I heard this in 1977, and then Srila Prabhupada passed away, naturally my mind went towards Srila Sridhar Maharaj, because he was still present on the earth, and uh, I very much desired to meet him. So what happened after that was that there was a, a letter of, so the GBC body, they approached Srila Sridhar Maharaj uh, in a formal way after the, uh, their GBC meetings, which happened a few months later, before Gaurabhima, 1978. And they 
inquired from him many, many questions. Uh, they specifically had many questions that none of them could answer because now there was a whole new dynamic after the disappearance of Prabhupada because who is going to become a guru? Who is going to initiate? And obviously some of the disciples would be becoming guru. And they had many questions about how this is going to work and how the, some of the godmothers will be gurus and some of them won't be gurus and how should they relate with one another. All of these kind of questions uh, regarding Vaishnava etiquette and regarding Guru Tattva, etc., etc. So they asked these questions and Srila Sridhar Maharaj gave a very voluminous answer to their questions. And this was printed, uh, this letter, uh, sorry, this uh, interview with him was uh, transcribed and it was printed in the letter form. Then it was sent out all throughout the world to all the different Islam temples at that time. I just happened to be in Nairobi, Africa at that time. And this letter came. It was a uh, 10 pages or 11 pages long, and it was the first time that I would ever read something by his personality. It was a few I was very, very interested by, you know, by what I just told. I was so curious to know, what does he speak? So then, when I was reading this letter, I, the impression, uh, the impression came to me very powerfully that, oh, he is a completely transcendentally realized personality. No one can speak like this unless they are. So, in that way, again, my desire to meet this person was stimulated. So, one more year passed, and in 1979, I found myself in Mayapur, Navadri, and at that time, I approached one of my godbrothers and I asked him, Have you ever met this personality? He was a Bengali godbrother, Bhakti Raksha Sridhar Maharaj. Have you ever met this person? And uh, then he said to me, Yes, I've met him. I go there sometimes also to see him. But don't tell anyone. And I said, Why? Why not to tell anyone? He said, Oh. You didn't hear that the GBC have uh, made a, um, uh, an order that no one should go to Sri Maharaj except for them, except for the GBC body. So when I heard this, I absolutely rejected it, 100%. And I said, I am going there. Who are they to stop me? you know, a disciple of Prabhupada, from going. But Prabhupada himself said that we can go to him for guidance after he leaves this world. So then he, then this godbrother of mine, he said, okay, I'll take you there. So then the next day, we boarded a boat across the Ganga and went on the rickshaw to the Sri Chaitanya Saraswati Mat. Now my heart was pounding as I approached this place. Uh, because I had met Srila Prabhupada many times and felt what it was like to be in the presence of such a Mahabharata Vaishnava. And now I'm about to meet another personality whom Prabhupada himself said is like equal to him in terms of realization. So I was so curious to know what this experience was going to be like. And as we entered the gates, I was feeling the transcendental potency of this divine mud with the presence of such a personality there. And when we came in, then one of the disciples greeted us, and he knew the like Bengali godbrother. And then he met us, he said, Oh, Guru Maharaj is upstairs. And it was summertime, so the, it was very hot in the evenings. So, and he was very elderly and somewhat invalid at that time. So he was resting on the rooftop in the open air, lying on a bed. So we came up the stairs, uh, and when we came up the stairs, there was no light, only there was moonlight. And his transcendental body was glistening in the moonlight. 
And I came to the top of the stairway and I felt like I'm about to approach, you know, like one of the ghost moms, this kind of personality. So when I approached, I picked my young about Pradam there and sat just where his head was looking up on his wooden bed. And then they informed him that two devotees had come and uh, he spoke a few words in Bengali to my Bengali godbrother. And he was also informed that there was uh, a Western devotee, English speaking Western devotee. So then I just was sitting next to the tent looking up towards the stars and suddenly he began speaking without any prompting. No question or anything, he just began speaking. And what was he telling? He had been completely absorbed in one of the verses of Srila Rupa Goswami, which glorifies the nectar of the two syllables of Krishna's holy name, Krishna. Tunde Tandarani Ratamdi Tante Tandarani Lakani. So, as he was describing this verse, he was continuing to unfold his realizations and he spoke on and on for like 10 or 15 minutes and my ears were glued to what he was speaking and uh, then after that he stopped and he informed us that he would prefer if we come in the morning sometime when he is feeling more energetic and uh, so he requested us to go and take some prasad. So we made, made our obeisances and made our way down the stairway. And at that time, I was just completely stunned because I had never heard any kind of this kind of type of parikata. In other words, you know, Srila Prabhupada, he was a divine personality. Mahabharata Vaishnava, I have heard his preaching many times. But yet, the Vaikata of Sri Srinivas was a completely different style. A completely different style. And now it was my first experience that, you know, pure devotees are not stereotypical, you know, carbon copies of each other. They have their own personalities. And uh, so when I experienced the uh, association of Srila Sridhar Maharaj, now my heart became so much in gladness, and I wanted to go and associate again. So at that time period, on two more occasions after that, I came and met with him in the early morning hours, and he, I would ask him one question, and then he would answer that question for about one hour. Now one thing about Srila Sridhar Maharaj is that he was the greatest Vaishnav scholar. He was the most erudite Sanskrit scholar and poet. You know, every morning we are singing the song that was written by him. Sujanaram Naradhitapada Yugam Yugadharam Yugam Narapad Prabhara Paradavaya Daya Utyapadam Pradamani Sadar Upad Upadam Srila Prabhupada Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was still living when he wrote this song. And when he heard this composition, he said, Oh, it is written in a very happy style. And he said, I want that this should be sung every morning in all of my months and all of my temples. So to this day, in all the Gaudi months, this song is sung before Mangalarti, glorifying to the Prabhupada Bhakti Siddhartha Sarsvati. And Shiva Sridhar wrote many other beautiful Sanskrit poetries glorifying Bhakti the Nolatakur, glorifying Shiva Bhakti Siddhartha Sarsvati. He wrote many. Glorifying each one of these personalities, Ashtakams and uh, Stavakams, and he even wrote an epic poem completely summarizing the entire life and transcendental diva of Sri Gauranga Mahaprabhu uh, in like 72 verses. Beautiful, amazing poetry written in a certain particular meter that was used by Sri Rupa Goswami in his poetry. And it's that, that epic poem is called Prema Dhamma Deva Stokra. One of the disciples of Srila Bhakti Siddhartha Saraswati named uh, Kishan Krishna Bhakti Maharaj. Uh, he was also an exalted Uttam Mahabhagwa Vaishnava. And he used to always like to sing this Prema Dhamma Deva Stokra. He particularly liked certain verses of this. 
And once, you know, he used to come and associate with Shil Shiramar and listen to his Hari Kata. So once <coughs> he was going, uh, Shil Shiramar heard that Babaji Maharaj was going to his own birthplace, meaning the birthplace of Shiva Sridhar Maharaj. His name Bird, he was born in, in the Gaur Mandala, in a village called Papaniya, Papaniya. So that place, actually Papaniya, I think it was called the Sweet Water, something like that. So in that place, Shiva, a king Shiva Krishnadas, who was his godmother, was going there and worshiping Shiva Sridhar Maharaj by taking the dust of that place, placing it on his head, and worshiping him. So when Sri Vashidhar Maharaj heard about this, then he said, what are you doing, Babaji Maharaj? You're going to find the first place? And then Sri Vashidhar Maharaj said, yes, I'm going to your birthplace, because I consider your compositions to be on the same level as Sri Vashidhar Goswami. He told that. Srila Bhakti Pramodu Puri Goswami Maharaj, also one of the exalted disciples of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he considered Srila Sridhar Maharaj to be his Siksha Guru. He wrote a Vyas Puja offering to Srila Sridhar Maharaj, glorifying him and continuing to call him Guru Maharaj, Guru Maharaj. This is a relationship. So many of the disciples of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, after the disappearance of Prabhupada, then they used to come to him and hear his Hare Kata. Uh, and they used to come and want to associate with him. Uh, and by the evidence that our own Param Gurudev accepted him as his Sanyas Guru, shows what kind of regard that he had for such personality. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur also told that mm, because he had written a certain composition, when Srila Bhakti Siddhanta read this, he said, oh, now I am satisfied that at least there is one personality for sure who can carry on these divine conceptions after I go. So Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati gave him the title Bhakti Raksha Srinath. And that means the guardian or the protector of this pathway of bhakti. So when Srila Sridhar Maharaj was commenting on this name, he said, uh, he said, I consider myself to not have been given entrance, but I am standing on the outside, like the God, uh, guarding the doorway so that unauthorized persons will not enter into these conceptions. And you know, many, many times, Srila Sridhar Maharaj, he would quote one verse, Pujala, Pujala Raga, Pujala Raga, Gaur Kabange, Matra Bhakti Jala Kirtana Raga. And the way that he would explain this, he would say that, actually, Srila Prabhupada, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, his preaching mood was encapsulated in these two lines. And what was it? He would explain that this pathway, this Radhamar pathway, and the mood of the eternal associates of Radha and Krishna, the eternal bridge Bhashi Gun. Uh, so their mood of worshiping Sri Krishna in their spontaneous mood of Radha, Radha being the praying, that must be worshipped by us, uh, by being held very high above our heads. That that conception should be worshipped when we are very low, we are below this, and that is so high. And what we must do is we must follow what Gauranga Mahaprabhu has given that pathway, that we go progressively step by step and not try to rush into these conceptions, not try to intrude into that area that we are not qualified for, but by worshipping these conceptions far above our heads, one day that that divine blessing will come from there and will give us entrance. So in this way, Shiva Siddhartha would explain like this. And he would warn very carefully in many of his lectures about not trying to jump. Uh, because although we may hear about these conceptions, although we may hear the Rasa Tattva descriptions from the mouths of the pure Vaishnavas, does 
first meet we are qualified. Huh? And therefore, we should be very, very careful. So she was Peter Maharaj used to say that his Guru Maharaj, what is not the source of the Thakur, he spent 90%. He himself told us that 90% of his time in his preaching mission uh, of studying the Gaudi Amat, 90% was, was devoted to describing what is not that thing that we are trying to approach. Uh, and the other 10% was given to describe what it is. So that was very clear. She was Sri Maharaj used to stand very firmly on this platform of guarding these conceptions. But yet, at the same time, in my experience of association with him, I was, uh, I noticed and I studied in his teachings that he was getting these conceptions even more so, he was revealing and opening up this treasure chest of Rupa Nukamaki mm -hmm. in a very careful way. There are at least 1,200 hours of his recorded Harikata in English language. Uh, because after the disappearance of our Prabhupada, there's a whole story, which I don't have time to tell, but I'd love to tell you all, the history and the story of how Sri Lashmira Maharaj was trying to help all the Western preaching mission is done and all the devotees, how he was trying to help them. But yet, uh, they were not able to recognize him as a well-wisher, and he was also rejected. Uh, so I don't want to get into this topic, otherwise I'll get too upset. But at any rate, she was Sridhar Maharaj. Uh, yeah, she was Sridhar Maharaj. He, he, uh, in his preaching, Srila Sridhar Maharaj was always giving these conceptions in a very careful manner. And you can hear it, and you can read it in his books. And I can say that, you know, the, the Rupa Nuka conception was completely exemplified by our uh, Goswami, Srila Raghunath Das Goswami Pad, who was the Prayota Tattva Acharya. And Srila Sridhar Maharaj so nicely explained how what he exemplified in his bhajan, Sadam bhajan, and how he took the teachings of Srila Rupa Goswami, how he relished them, and how he uh, manifested this incredible level of Sadam bhajan on the banks of Radha Kunda, dying in separation moved from Srimati Radhika. This is the pinnacle. And this is the ultimate attainment. Uh, how in our sampradaya we are praying and begging that one day we may be able to attain Varadha Gasyam, the service of the lowest speed of Shimati Radhika. So this conception I was not very aware of. I can say that. I was not very aware of that conception prior uh, to uh, coming to the lowest speed of Shiva Sridhar Maharaj. And one reason is that our Shiva Prabhupada, Bhaktivedanta Swami Maharaj, he had a grand mission to implant Krishna Bhakti and the Krishna conceptions into the Western civilization. Huh? And that was not an easy task. So therefore, his focus and his concentration, Srila Sridhar Maharaj explained, because bringing it to the masses, it has to be given in a more general way. Therefore, most of his lectures and his teachings, they were geared toward an audience in which he was explaining the principles by which one may come into the path of bhakti. So this is called Sambandha Tattva, Sambandha Tattva. So I want to make a point, which I also made a number of years ago, and I'm not going to speak much longer than this, uh, but you know that if I became so much aware that Srila Bhakti Raksha Srila Maharaj was giving something that I, that I was not able to conceive of prior to that, even though I had read the books, of our Sri Prabhupada, very diligently had read them, but somehow I had not been able to enter. So Srila Sridhar Maharaj, as our Guru Dev said many times, this treasure chest is under lock and key. 
You can't just enter. If you don't have the qualifications, and you don't have the other car, you cannot penetrate. You cannot force your way in just by reading the books. You have to hear these conceptions from the lips of a realized Rusty Vaishnava. Uh, therefore, Rupa Goswami has said, Srimad Bhagavatam Kana Asvadona Shikai Sahab. You should taste the transcendental meaning of Srimad Bhagavatam in the association of Rusty Vaishnava. So I had this experience that when I came in connection with Srimad Sridhar Maharaj, a whole other aspect of our Gaudiya Siddhanta opened up to me, even though it was there in the books, even though I had read it, but I had not become aware of it. So I consider that, you know, this amongst the Goswamis, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu designated that Srila Sanatan Goswami would be the Acharya of Sambhanda Tattva. That means introducing Sambhanda Gyan. And Srila Rupa Goswami would be the Acharya of Abhideya Tattva. Abhideya means that, that process by which, by performing Siddha Bhakti, uh, we may one day attain the ultimate goal of Krishna prayer. And the ultimate goal is called Prayota. So Srila Ramana Das Goswami became the Prayota Tattva Acharya. So it dawned on me that in the modern day, I mean, I'm only saying this from my own consideration. And that in my own experience, by my association with Srila Prabhupada, the focus and attention uh, and the uh, aiming entry into some Bhagavad Tattva Gyan was so prominent in his preaching. So I consider him, in the modern day, the Sambhanda Tattva Acharya of our Sampradaya. Uh, and then Srila Bhakti Nacho Sridhar Maharaj, after him, began to explain very, very, very extensively about what he did at Tattva. What is Bhakti? Especially, how do you enter Bhakti? What is Sharanagati? What is surrender? That principle of Sharanagati, Srila Sridhar Maharaj wrote volumes, spoke volumes about it. Because without surrender, you cannot have Bhakti. So that is what Srila Sridhar Maharaj focused on so much and describing these other conceptions as well. But Srila then, therefore I consider him to be the Abhidaya Tattva Acharya. And then in my life, by the cause of his mercy, and uh, unexpected mercy, of Sri Gaurava Mahaprabhu and my Guru Maharaj, I was able to come in connection with a personality who is going to unfold the Prayota for the whole world. And has done that. That is our beloved Guru Day, Om Vishnu Shri It is evidence. Anyone can understand that what he has come to give, what is his mission? It is continuing the mission of these acharyas to unfold finally uh, this Prayota Tattva. What is this Radhagasya? How everything that we are doing in our Sadhana Bhaja is ultimately aiming towards this. Therefore, when he came to the Western countries, to preach. Therefore he told everyone, first you have to fix what is your goal, your sadhya. And after fixing what is your sadhya, then you can determine what sadhana, what practice you're going to perform to attain that sadhya. So, in this way, Srila Guru did, he became the Prayoja Tattva Acharya of our Sampradaya in the modern day. He has given these Rupa Dukkha conceptions 